Clyde Sadens, who's going to be our speaker today, we invited him in June of last year to give a talk that was really fascinating on gravitational waves. And it was a, sort of a mutual admiration thing. He liked us, we liked him, and he is now in charge of our uh, science programs. He seems to know everybody, and it is a wonderful thing that he kind of has taken charge and lines up very interesting programs every month for our science talks. Clyde, until very recently, chaired the physics department at CU Denver, and uh, he has um, lived in a wonderful place that he hated to give up in Washington. But he's now here in, in Denver, and I would like to have you welcome Clyde Zadens. Thank you, I have a, I you have just a, make a work. Have Does this work? Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Okay. I hope it's not too loud. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I have a chance to tell a story about something that's a passion of mine, uh, the origin of the chemical elements. It's something that uh, I have been interested in uh, as long as I've been a student and uh, faculty and researcher and all sorts of things like that. Uh, and everything in this room is made out of chemicals. Everything on our earth is made out of chemicals. In fact, most of the stuff that you can see in the universe is made out of chemicals. Uh, but not everything. Let's take a look here. Okay, so the stuff in the world that we can see only makes up about 5% of the composition of the universe. Now, what I have to tell you is that I am basing everything on what I consider to be the best theory we have for the universe and cosmology, which is the Big Bang. And recently, in fact, uh, just this week, Jim Peebles at Princeton University was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on cosmology. Uh, he, he's an amazing guy. I've been listening to him talk for 50 years. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Jim Peebles is, is uh, a person who was one of the architects of the way we look at the universe today. But what we're going to be interested in is the 5% of the universe that we actually touch and feel and, and affects us every day. So this is what the, the current picture of the universe is supposed to be like today. And this fits the, uh, the, um, all of the data, well, it fits the data as well as anything probably could, given that we can't go back and run the universe's uh, history over again. So what we have to do, and this is why I call it a story, what we need to do is to use the physics and chemistry and astronomy and everything that we can make measurements now, and from that infer what happened in order for us to have where, uh, to be where we are today. Mm. Oh, do I point it this direction? Ah, I was pointing the wrong way. Sorry about that. This is all new to me. Okay, so this 5% of the universe is, the, is what affects us all the time. And so this is our tangible matter. And it's all made out of chemical elements. Uh, every, anything that's solid uh, is, is made out of chemical elements. <laughs> okay, so the solar system is about four and a half billion years old, which is pretty young compared to the universe, which is about 13.8 billion years old. This is based on the Big Bang Theory and the measurements that have been made. Uh, Jim Peeble said that when he started doing this in 1964, looking at cosmology was considered to be looking at mythology, but now there's been enough measurements that we really can uh, compare things. In fact, when I first started out, they said anything in astrophysics, if you could match it within a power of 10, it would be okay. Now we get it down to small percentage errors. In fact, people are worrying about tiny differences in the measurement of the expansion rate of the universe. So the solar system was formed from a cloud of gas and dust. Uh, this was the stuff that was here when uh, this big, large uh, cloud of dust, gas and dust coalesced to make our solar system. So the chemical elements that were there four and a half billion years ago are the chemical elements we see today, with the exception of those that are radioactive and, and decayed away, which is a fairly small fraction of the whole mess. Okay, uh, everything is made up of this. This is the chemical elements. The basic uh, building block is the atom. Uh, by the year uh, 1900, most people believed that atoms existed. Prior to that, it was pretty much conjecture, but now, uh, 
we believe in atoms. We've actually been able to see it. When I was a, a chemistry student in high school, they said, you'll never see an atom. Now you can actually see pictures of atoms. So we've come a long way in that. I won't tell you when I was in high school. It was a long time ago. Uh, molecules are combinations of atoms. So OK, we need a little review of chemistry. OK, so there's 118 different chemical elements. Many of them have been made uh, artificially in the last uh, 70 or 80 years. Uh, they are organized into the periodic table of the chemical elements. Uh, each element has a square, and each of them have a, a symbol. Like one of the most common ones is carbon, and it's been around long enough that its symbol is just a single letter C. Most of them are, are two letters. Incidentally, this is the 150th anniversary of Mendeleev coming up with the periodic chart of the chemical elements, so it's kind of a propitious time to talk about them. This is a picture of the periodic table. I like this one. It's, it's a very nice one, and it's complete. It goes all the way up to uh, element 118. Uh, and there's a lot of chemistry in here that we don't need for this particular subject, but uh, this is one of my favorite periodic charts. I was introduced to a new one yesterday, but uh, I won't have time to talk about that now. OK, what are atoms? Atoms are, uh, in case you haven't ever seen one, uh, most of us haven't. Uh, they are made of a dense central nucleus. This was something that Rutherford uh, did. Uh, he had his students do his experiment for him, but when he did the experiment, uh, they were able to tell that the atom had this very dense, small uh, nucleus surrounded by electrons. And the chemistry that we normally think about, uh, chemical reactions and so on, uh, are a, a result of what the electrons are doing. However, the number of electrons and where they're located is, is a uh, function of what the positive charge on the nucleus is. So the, the positive charge for a neutral atom actually balances exactly the electron's negative charge. OK, so we need to know a few things. These are the basic building blocks. In fact, in roughly 1935, we thought we understood the entire thing. We knew that there was a lot of work to be done. But the universe was made up of atoms. The atoms had nuclei that were made of protons and neutrons uh, surrounded by electrons. We had already discovered quantum mechanics. Uh, and so we thought we knew everything. Ha! Huh. It wasn't the case. OK, but here are things we do need to know and which we could have talked about in the, the 1930s. There are these numbers that are integers. Z is the number of protons, and it's called the atomic number. N is the number of neutrons. And A, which is, you, you know, it's not unique because once you uh, have Z and N, you add them together. But that's called the atomic mass number. Now, it's not equal to the mass. But it is very close to the, uh, it's an integer, and it's close to what the actual mass is. And, and it's an important parameter in understanding what's going on with these atoms. OK, all the atoms that have the same D are the same chemical element. Atoms that have the same D but a different number of neutrons, these are called isotopes. Uh, and many elements have more than one stable and a number of unstable uh, radioactive isotopes. In fact, there's a couple of. Uh, atoms that uh, are not at the uranium and very heavy uh, atoms that are not stable. But most have at least one stable uh, isotope. Carbon is a good example because uh, we have a lot of carbon around. So the carbon uh, isotopes are carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. All of them have Z equals 6. But for carbon-13 uh, and, and for carbon-12, N is 6 and Z equals 6. For carbon-13, uh, Z is 6 and N is 7. And carbon-14, Z is uh, 6 and N is 8. Carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable. And everybody's body has a lot of carbon in it. And 99% uh, of that carbon is carbon-12. 1% of that is carbon-13. And there's this very small trace down to less than parts per billion of carbon-14. But carbon-14, I'm sure you've probably heard of it because it's very important in dating old objects. It's radioactive. It has a half-life of about 5,700 years. And so it's very useful in dating anything that was at one time alive, including the charcoal from <laughs> burned woods and uh, fires that were done by some of our early ancestors. OK, unstable nuclei decay. I just wanted to point out some of the 
common decay process. This carbon-14 that I just mentioned decays to nitrogen-14. It gives up an electron and actually an anti-neutrino, but that little uh, Greek letter nu is the neutrino. Nitrogen-13 decays to carbon-13, but it gives up a positron, which is the same as an electron except it's the antiparticle of the electron. It has a positive charge, and it also gives up neutrinos. Uh, plutonium-239, uh, something that gets an awful lot of bad press for good reason, uh, decays to uranium-235 plus an alpha particle. Alpha particle is the helium-4 nucleus. Uh, Ernest Rutherford, who was one of the true geniuses of uh, early physics, uh, was the person who, with uh, his colleague uh, in Canada, uh, came up with characterizing the three main types of radioactive decay, alpha, beta, and gamma decay. Uh, gammas are very high energy light. They are, uh, we call them photons too, but uh, we just, just so when you see these symbols a little bit later, you know what I'm talking about. So gamma is a gamma ray. Incidentally, we have too many uh, things that we have to name, which is why the Greek alphabet is uh, always being used. Uh, every time I uh, taught a course, I always handed uh, out a uh, copy of the Greek alphabet to the students. One time, a uh, student gave it back to me and told me, I'm Greek. So he didn't, he didn't need it, but for everybody else, it came in handy. Okay, we can imagine all possible combinations of Z and N. You can imagine just a random number generator that ge generates Z and N, but that's not what nature does. So I want to talk about the chart of the nuclides, and uh, what we're doing, we're seeing a plot of all of the cases where there actually do exist nuclei or nuclides, uh, and here's what it looks like. Uh, I want to say a little bit about this, because you're going to see another one in, in different colors a little bit later. Uh, those vertical and horizontal bars are called magic numbers. The black squares, and you can see this is curving over towards more neutrons than, than protons. The black squares are the stable nuclei. These are the ones that we actually find in nature. There's a little over 200 stable nuclides, or, or stable isotopes if you want to call them that. Uh, and all the other things that are in these different colors, blues and greens, and I'm, not, I'm sort of colorblind, so I don't know all of them, pink it looks like, those are the radioactive ones. But if you look very carefully, and by the way, uh, a copy of my talk is going to be a PDF on the website. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when it'll be up, but uh, if I go too fast, which I probably will, uh, you can go back and look at them uh, and see some of these, because these are really nice curves. Anyway, those vertical and horizontal bars are called magic numbers. Now experimentally, we knew that certain numbers of protons and certain numbers of neutrons had a lot more isotopes than the others, and these were particularly stable. But we didn't understand why. Maria Mayer figured it out using the shell model for nuclei. She won the Nobel Prize for it. Sadly, only one of three women who've ever won the Nobel Prize in physics, but hopefully there'll be more in the future. Anyway, so this is, this is a chart that's very useful for nuclear physicists, uh, and that tells you where all of the stable nuclei. So if any Z and N were possible, this whole uh, screen would be filled with dots. You can see there is something that, that follows that, those black squares. That's called the valley of stability or the region of stability. And we can go off a little bit on either direction and have radioactivity, but eventually you can't even make a nucleus that isn't somewhat close to the uh, region of stability. Okay, here's a cartoon of an atom. Uh, everyone's seen this. It has nothing to do with what it really looks like. Uh, and, I, you know, I did this calculation and it, it amazed me. I knew it was small, but if you were in the baseball stadium, say we were in Coors Field, and Coors Field was the size of the atom, the nucleus would be the size of a pea, say, sitting in the pitcher's mound or something like that. It's, it's uh, 15 orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the atom at large. It's very hard to understand that. So, you know, this is a beautiful cartoon, but it's not close to realistic. This is more realistic because the electrons aren't little planets going around a, a solar system. They're a fuzzy cloud of waves uh, and this is a much better picture, but it's still not to scale. I mean, I, it wouldn't be possible. If we, if 
you know, if, if we were going to talk about this room as being the size of the baseball stadium, then it would just be one of those uh, dust mites that are floating around uh, in terms of the size of the nucleus. Okay, the common isotopes of hydrogen and helium, and this is important because when we, the majority of the material in the universe, not on our Earth, but in the universe, is hydrogen and helium. Uh, so the isotopes of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen is the only one whose isotopes actually have their own nicknames. Uh, H2, uh, in other words, A equals 2, Z equals 1 for hydrogen. H2 is deuterium and H3 is tritium. And again, tritium is a radioactive uh, uh, isotope. It has about a 12-year half-life. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, we, we try to avoid exposing yourself to too much radiation, but the truth is we're being exposed to radiation all the time. Cosmic rays at our altitude, uh, uh, anything with concrete or wood, or the real the truth is everybody in this room is radioactive. You have muscles, muscles have potassium, and one of the isotopes of potassium is a 1.3 billion year half-life, uh, so we all, uh, if we were to have a, a gamma ray detector put up next to us, it would show up that we were radioactive. So, can't get away from it. The two isotopes of helium, helium-3 and helium-4. Helium-4 is by far the most abundant. There's, uh, helium-3 is, is pretty rare. Okay, an important experimental fact that we're going to have to worry about a little bit later is that there are no stable isotopes of any element whatsoever with A equals 5 or A equals 8. And this is a barrier that makes it harder to make our chemical elements. George Gamow in 1948 came up with a picture for making everything in, in all the chemicals, all in being made in the Big Bang. No, can't happen, because these are hurdles that can't be uh, jumped over. So you're going to be seeing uh, that that's going to come back, something we have to worry about a little bit later. OK, chemical reactions. I know we know about uh, chemical reactions, for example, uh, when we uh, use uh, natural gas in order to uh, heat our house. What we're doing is we're, uh, methane is reacting with the oxygen. When we burn the methane, we have to have oxygen, of course, to do that. When that burns, it makes carbon dioxide and water. And uh, this is a, I just picked that out at random as a chemical reaction that, that we're familiar with. All of our biological uh, met metabolism are chemical reactions as well. And they're way too complicated for me to understand. I'm not a biochemist. Uh, but, you know, there's just everything we do. Uh, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Clearly, there had to be a chemical reaction that caused that to happen. Okay. But chemical reactions cannot change Z, N, or A. You have to have nuclear reactions. And when nuclear reactions occur, they, in order to make them recur, to occur or have them give off energy, it's about a factor of a million more than chemical reactions. In fact, it's pretty darn close to a, to a factor of a million. So these are really high energy uh, kinds of reactions. Uh, historically, uh, people, including Sir Isaac Newton, were trying to do alchemy. Alchemy was the attempt to take uh, base metals and turn them into gold. Uh, I don't think they were successful, although some people would argue with me on that. Uh, but uh, today we can do it fairly easily. We need big machines uh, in order to be able to do that. But uh, the chemical elements were formed by a process called nucleosynthesis. And where does nucleosynthesis occur? Well, a lot of it is in the stars. So we're going to have to learn some astronomy. The neat thing about this story is it needs chemistry, it needs physics, it needs astronomy. Uh, all of these things come together. This, this is a story, but it's one that I firmly believe is not something that's not a myth. OK. Uh, we observe stars. We have to measure their properties. We can't see inside stars. So basically what we do is we use the laws of physics and chemistry in order to understand what's happening inside the star. We do models. Uh, actually, uh, people like uh, Lord Kelvin and Helmholtz were doing models of stars in the 19th century using algebra. Uh, but uh, 
Today's computers allow us to make much more accurate models. And I've got a picture later on that, that I'll show you as a result of, of the kind of calculations that can be done with computers today. When I was a uh, graduate student, we were, of course, running our experiments all night long. We, we would get the machine for, for 72 hours. And so for three days in a row, we would keep on working. The theoretical people who did these calculations would come in at midnight when nobody else was using the computer and run the computer all night long. And we were always kind of impressed with the fact that we were there with our machines and they were there with the computers at night. But now things are so much faster. Uh, every, you know, you've heard this cliche before. Everybody's cell phone in their pocket is more than the uh, computing power of the big computer at Caltech when I was a student. So. And they, you don't have to punch cor cards in order to be able to, to look at the. For those of you old enough to know what punch cards are, <laughs> are. OK, so nuclear astrophysics is the application of experimental, theoretical, and computational studies to the, uh, understand the interior of the star. Um, and this is what I did for a part of my research, was to measure reactions that we were pretty sure would occur in stars. But you need to know how reactive it is. You have to have numbers. Uh, at some temperature, what's the reaction rate going to be, depending on the densities and so on. So this was the kind of, of experimental work that we did, both when I was a student at Caltech and at the uh, now defunct cyclotron up at the Boulder campus. This was where we were doing these experiments. OK, there are three important related questions. This gets back down to, the, to real basics. Why do stars shine? Why are there so many different star appearances? If you uh, actually study the stars, you see that some of them are bluish white, some of them are very red, some of them are yellow like our sun. Uh, some of them are, are, it turns out to be huge. They're giants. Some of them are very small. They're dwarfs. They have different, the different colors and everything. And finally, where do the chemical reactions come from, which is, of course, what uh, chemical elements come from, which is, of course, what the whole uh, title of this talk is about. They come together. Okay. Why do stars shine? Nuclear reactions in the star generate energy. That's, that, uh, that's important. Why are there so many different kinds of stars? Well, stars use their nuclear fuel. They age. Things change. They can't burn one kind of fuel. They have to go to another kind of fuel. Their structure and appearance changes. And this is the field of stellar evolution. So uh, not only uh, is there biological evolution, but there's stellar evolution. And we often use the word life for stars, even though they aren't living objects. Uh, one can make an argument that, well, we've been observing stars seriously for a couple hundred years, maybe. Uh, and yet we're extrapolating back billions of years of what is happening, many millions of years. We are able to predict that the sun is, has, a ha has a lifetime of about uh, 10 billion years. Uh, how do we do this? Well, there's a very nice analogy that I'll just get to quickly. Suppose there was an alien that came to Earth, knew nothing about us, and had to come up to report back to their uh, people uh, what was life like, what was the, the life cycle. So they could go anywhere they wanted. So they would go to senior citizen centers. They would go to mortuaries. They would go to uh, uh, places where babies were being born. Uh, they would see uh, teenagers and so on. And they would be able to put together a fairly good picture of what human life is like in a day. Well, it's the same sort of thing that we have to do. In a couple hundred years, we're supposed to explain what's happening over a period of, of millions of years. OK, uh, and then the stellar nuclear reactions that provide this nucleosynthesis uh, are causing the, uh, the nature of the chemical elements that are around to change. Because when these nuclear reactions occur, we are doing alchemy. But not all nucleosynthesis starts in, occurs in the stars. There are other places. And this is why the story is very rich. Or we want to use the word complicated. We can do that. But I like the word rich better. OK, so these are the four main nucleosynthesis sites. Uh, and this, most of this was actually put together uh, over 60 years ago. Uh, but the details needed to be worked out. And there was a lot of things that the people who did this didn't completely understand. I'm going to talk about them in, in just a minute. So the Big Bang that occurred, we believe, 13.8 billion years ago did produce some chemical elements, mainly hydrogen helium, as we'll see. 
stellar nucleosynthesis. That's all the phases of a star from the moment it begins to burn its hydrogen fuel to the time it explodes as a supernova. Spallation, we'll get back to this at the very end. It's not, it doesn't occur in stars and it's occurring today and it's due to cosmic rays hitting particles in the interstellar medium. Mm, I seem to be ringing. Uh, but, but what it does is it hits certain large nuclei and breaks it up into small pieces. And then finally, and this was one of the most exciting things that's happened in, in my entire career, is when they discovered the merging neutron stars, the binary star system, and were able to actually see the results of nucleosynthesis at that moment. This is fantastic. Like we can't, even though we can't run the clock backwards to the, what happened in the past, we can actually see this, and there's one other example of seeing nucleosynthesis actually occurring today. Okay, these are the pioneers. Uh, they unfortunately aren't all of them, but there's the Burbage, Burbage, Fowler, and Hoyle paper in 1957, which all the people who work in the field call B squared FH. Um, and Margaret Burbage just celebrated her 100th birthday in San Diego uh, earlier this year. Uh, unfortunately, everybody else on this uh, slide is, is gone. Willie Fowler, okay, Margaret Burbage, Jeffrey Burbage, uh, Willie Fowler, and Fred Hoyle. Uh, Willie Fowler was one of my advisors when I was a graduate student, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1985. Uh, all of these people, I think, should probably have been included, but they can't do that. So, and so, so Fowler, when he gave his press conference the day he was in a, he said, everybody who's ever worked with me has won part of this prize. So I actually have a tiny bit of a Nobel <laughs> Prize, having worked with Willie Fowler. Al Cameron, interestingly enough, he was working all on his own in Canada, publishing in obscure journals, but he did this pretty much the same thing they did all by himself, and it wasn't until later people began to recognize just how important that he was doing the same thing that, that this very powerful team of people had done. So Al Cameron was finally uh, given his due, but uh, he was ignored for a long time. Okay, this is another chart of the nuclides. It doesn't have everything in there. Uh, I'm not going to say much about it here, but uh, you know, if you do want to go dig to, into this further and look at the PDF, you can look at this because what it does Instead of just giving the chemical properties, this has uh, examples of what, uh, how these uh, are made um, in, in uh, various ways. Big Bang, uh, neutron stars, low mass stars, and so on. Anyway, I just know that that's there if you want to look more deeply. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Well, uh, yes. Uh, I have a, I, my understanding of the Big Bang was that in, in the early stages, there were no, there were no real particles. There were no. Be patient. Oh, you will get to that. Good. Okay. The, the Big Bang occurred about 13.8 billion years ago. From about 10 seconds to 1,000 seconds after the beginning, beginning, the conditions were ripe for Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Before this period, it was too hot, and after it was too cool. So that answers your question. There was this time, in fact. Uh, Steven Weinberg wrote a very nice book on this uh, 30 years ago or so called The First Three Minutes. And he, he talked about that in his. So about three minutes after the Big Bang, uh, this is what was occurring. So uh, during the Big Bang uh, period, the universe continued to expand very quickly. The temperature dropped during this era of, uh, of uh, 10 to 1,000 seconds from about uh, 11th Kelvin to 10 to the 9th Kelvin. Uh, and just for those of you who aren't familiar with the Kelvin scale, it's an absolute scale where zero is, is the coldest possible temperature. Uh, but just to put something in perspective, water boils at 373 Kelvin. So uh, 100 Celsius, 212 Fahrenheit, but not in Denver. Some people don't know that. Okay, the first chemical elements were formed during this period, mostly hydrogen and helium. Uh, we got some uh, heavy helium, heavy, I mean helium-3 and helium and hydrogen-2, but mostly hydrogen-1 and helium-4. At the time when the Big Bang was over, more than 99% of all the material in the universe was hydrogen and helium. 
uh, there was a very small trace of lithium-7, which is an interesting puzzle, something I'm going to work on when I retire, because uh, it's, it's close, but it's not, there, there's some puzzles associated with it. Okay, then for a long time, nothing really happens until the stars are formed. And now, once we have a star, we can have nuclear reactions occurring inside the star. Okay, so, okay, we need to know some facts about stars if we're going to understand stellar nucleosynthesis. So basically, um, we can't see inside the star, but we can see what the surface looks like. We can, there are cases where we can get the mass, the radius, the brightness, the temperature. The temperature turns out to be the easiest thing. Chemical composition is also fairly easy. So this is what we used in order to make our mathematical models of what's happening inside the star. With a, a rare exception I'll talk about a little bit later, all of these reactions are occurring in the near center to the star or at the very center. The surface of stars are typically too cool for any nuclear reactions to occur. For example, our sun has a surface temperature a little over 5,000 kelvins. 5,000 kelvins is pretty hot, but it's not hot enough for nuclear reactions. The center of our sun is about 14 million kelvins. That works. Okay, uh, stars form from clouds, uh, collapsing clouds of dust and gas. Our sun was formed at the same time our sol the rest of our solar system was formed. The sun has more than 99% of the mass in our solar system. Uh, they go through all these different stages. They change their structure. Uh, some fuels get used up. And new fuels have to come into existence, uh, come into the t region where they can actually start reacting. Uh, and eventually the star dies. Again, this is the life uh, analogy that we use. So we have remnants that are left over. I, I call them fossils. White dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. And I like to call them the stellar graveyard because they're not, they're no longer any nuclear reactions occurring. They're there, they're a corpse, but that's all they are. Okay, gravity, again, it's, it's, it's a fight between gravity and the nuclear reactions. So once you use up, for example, the first stage of the star, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, is hydrogen burning, turning hydrogen into helium. And uh, but eventually, the hydrogen gets used up, and the star collapses. And, and uh, as it collapses, maybe the helium that's been formed from the hydrogen gets hot enough to be able to react, and so on. This goes on. It depends on the mass of the star. Less massive stars, basically, they can only burn the helium, and then they stop, and they become white dwarfs. Star, stars that are more massive, and I'll give you the boundary uh, in a little bit, uh, become supernova. They blow up and they become neutron stars or black holes. Okay, so we classify stars in terms of their mass, size, brightness, temperature, and so on. And this is uh, the way that astronomers do this. There are things called the HR diagrams. Uh, Einar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell independently in different continents came up with this. It was a beautiful idea. And basically what you do is you plot the... Uh, brightness of the star, the intrinsic brightness of the star uh, versus its temperature. And uh, so let me just show you what they look like. Okay, this is an HR diagram. This region here, where most of the stars are, is called the main sequence. These are the stars that are burning hydrogen and turning into helium. As they evolve, they leave the main sequence and move up. There is a, yeah, this is, see, yeah, okay. So this is the uh, main sequence line. These are the giants. These come in a later stage. And then eventually, for those stars that uh, become white dwarfs, this is where the white dwarfs are. What this plot is, brightness goes up this way. The higher on this curve, the brighter it is. This is kind of weird, but it's backwards. Low temperatures are here. High temperatures are here on this diagram. But this is a standard HR diagram. Uh, speaking of cartoons, the next HR diagram I like because it has a picture of uh, some of the stars whose names we might know. Uh, and let's see, it's a hard direction for me. I think the sun is somewhere in there. I see a sun. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so this, this is very useful for astronomers. And of course, useful for us as we try to figure out what nuclear reactions occur at what stages. So in order to be able to test how well our, 
origin theories are, we have to fit data. There are abundances and we need to be able to say, do we fit these abundances? If we do, we're confident that we probably are on the right track. If we don't, uh, 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 it's back to where, square one, try and figure things out. So anyway, so here's a couple of plots of the experimental data, what's measured in our solar system. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's not quite. This is, this is another uh, plot like the one that I mentioned before that plotted uh, the proton number here and the neutron number there. Uh, this actually, what we want to talk about is the uh, beta, de beta decay. Stable nuclei that are cut off from the other stable ones. Yeah. Huh. No. It, it, Okay, one of the things that nuclear physicists do, because we have models of how they're supposed to behave, but we can experimentally measure how they're supposed to behave, and they always have some, some surprises for us. Okay, these are the abundance plots that I mentioned. Uh, so what we're going to do is first, this is the abundance of the chemical elements, Plotted versus the atomic number, so each of these chemical elements. You notice the zigzags. The zigzags, there is an even odd uh, uh, stability dependence uh, that you actually pointed out the other day at breakfast. Uh, there are a couple things here that I want you to notice. First of all, hydrogen and helium, of course, way more. This is a logarithmetic curve, so each one of these is a factor of 10, not uh, an arithmetic increment. But uh, we like uh, this axis is logarithmetic, but this one is just uh, arithmetic or uh, linear. So there are a couple of things I want to point out besides that. Carbon and oxygen are fairly abundant. That's important. Uh, I just want to point out how abundant nickel is. If you were going to look for a very smooth curve, which doesn't, doesn't fit badly, iron is a little high. We'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing to notice and we'll ask the question this way, why is there so little lithium, boron, and beryllium? We're going to turn that question around a little bit later, but for the time being, isn't this a puzzle? Uh, you would expect it to be somewhere in here, and no, they're way down here. Unfortunately, lithium is way down there, and we really need lithium, unless we come up with a new kind of battery. Okay, this is the same curve, of course. Notice that even if you plot it versus mass number, versus A rather than versus Z, uh, we still have these same uh, iron is high, lithium, beryllium, and boron is low, carbon, of course, is high, and hydrogen and helium are, are high. Anyway, so that's what we have to fit. Okay, since I mentioned the iron peak, the iron, we'll talk about what's called the iron peak, and the astronomers and astrophysicists talk about that. These roughly are the elements with atomic number 24 to 28. They are the chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel. And they are very stable nuclei. And this is an important part of the whole nucleosynthesis picture. Uh, you know, we're not surprised there's a lot of iron around. Uh, and now we have a pretty good idea of why that's true, as we will see here. This is uh, maybe the most uh, interesting curve in terms of uh, where we were going. Uh, what we have is the higher up a nucleus is or a nuclide is on this scale, the more stable it is. Uh, so things like uh, deuterium and, and uh, tritium and so on, notice some of them are especially stable. Helium-4 is more stable than a smooth curve would say. Uh, same is true for carbon and oxygen. Uh, but notice the very highest part of this curve is right around the isotope iron 56. Uh, and as we go to heavier nuclei, they get less stable. These are the most stable nuclei, those around the iron peak. And uh, if you think about this, if you take smaller or light, I should say lighter nuclei and put them together, you get energy out to make them more stable. It's just like something falling off the table as it goes from a higher potential gravitational down to the lower. So the same thing, nuclear potential going up here. Way up here, 
Uranium, uranium-235, not 238, is the one that fissions, breaks up into smaller pieces because it's more stable for it to break up. So this part of the curve explains fission. This explains fusion. And the hope is someday that we will actually be able to generate electricity with uh, nuclear fusion. However, let me be a little personal here. When I was a student, uh, first studying nuclear physics, fusion was 20 years away. I am now retiring, I'm 80 years old, fusion is 20 years away. So uh, I, th I think we need to uh, wonder whether we're chasing our tail. It would be great if it, if it worked, but uh, it, there's always, I mean, we can make fusion. What we, can't, uh, what we can't do is make it so that it, we get more out than we put in. And that's, of course, uh, the famous joke about guy who sells everything at a loss, but he makes up for it in volume. It would be the same sort of problem here. OK. So the nucleosynthesis processes, I'm just going to go through these quickly, because I'm not sure how much time I have to do the detail, because I'm going to come back to them a little bit later. So the first step in a star in the main sequence is it burns hydrogen. It does it by two possible ways, the proton-proton chain or the CNO cycle. Temperature is roughly around 10 to the seventh Kelvins up to about three, well, that's 10 million Kelvins up to 30 million Kelvins. Then the next thing that happens is three helium fours come together to make uh, carbon 12. And then the carbon 12 interacts with the helium to make oxygen 16. That happens at about 100 million Kelvins. Then carbon and oxygen can burn in those stars that are massive enough to, to, to go this far at about a billion Kelvins. And then finally, at about 3 billion Kelvins, everything breaks down. It's really chaotic. It very quickly goes to, sorry, that wasn't what I wanted to do, very quickly goes to the Iron Peak. It's just an equilibrium kind of problem. It's you, just something that, that happens quickly. The silicon, which you re, once you reach silicon, then it just sort of zips on down in a very short period of time to the Iron Peak. Okay, the, if a star is about eight times the mass of our sun, it's called a massive, uh, high mass star. If it's less than uh, eight times the mass of our sun, it's a low mass star. Uh, the low mass stars like our sun will never go beyond the helium burning and the high mass stars pr proceed all the way to the uh, Iron Peak and then eventually supernova. Okay, there are other nucleosynthesis pro processes that occur in stars. Uh, the S process occurs in the envelopes, which is the outer part of, out, outer part of uh, giant stars. Uh, this is a very slow addition of neutrons to the seed nuclei. The R process occurs when a very rapid explosion occurs and we get a uh, very rapid addition of neutrons to the seed nuclei. And the P process, it has to occur because we have some uh, nuclides that are stable that cannot be made by the addition of neutrons. So these are basically all of the processes that occur inside a star. Okay, supernovae. Um, these are the light curves of a supernova, something that uh, has been studied over a long period of time, uh, even going back into antiquity. Uh, Asian astronomers actually took uh, uh, careful notes, so we know where some of the uh, early supernovae occurred. Anyway, we have uh, two types of supernova that we're going to talk about here. The uh, type 1A, which is where a white dwarf turns into a supernova, which I'll explain in a minute. And then there's the core collapse supernovae, which are those supernovae that come from mass stars that are high mass stars, reach the Iron Peak. Because the Iron Peak, you can no longer get any energy out. It's gravitationally unstable. It collapses. There's this huge explosion. And that's our type 2 supernovae. Incidentally, how many people remember uh, Supernova 1987? Uh, the only one that was visible, it was not in our galaxy, but it was visible from uh, the Southern Hemisphere, uh, and it was a type 2 supernova. And boy, Okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so the type 1 supernova 
uh, are very interesting, and I don't have time to talk much more about them. But Subramanian Chandrasekhar uh, came up with a, the first convincing model of what a white dwarf really is. A uh, white dwarf is so dense that if we could get a sugar cube piece of uh, a white dwarf and measure it here on Earth, which we can't do, but if we could, it would weigh about a ton, something of the size of a cubic centimeter. Sorry about that, Randy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's very, very dense. But his calculation said you can't have a white dwarf that's stable that's more than 1.44 times the sun's mass. That's called the Chandrasekhar limit. And so if you are, have a, a white dwarf in a binary star system, it may be pulling mass off its partner and growing and growing. And so if it actually accretes enough material for it to explode, then it becomes a uh, type 1a supernova. And it can, because it has carbon and oxygen, it basically makes uh, all of the, the chemicals from neon to zinc, all the way up to the iron peak. Uh, and these are fairly common. In fact, they have been used as standard candles because they almost all have the same, or the assumption, of course, is that they're the same brightness. And so we can tell something about uh, very great distances because these are very bright uh, uh, supernova. So they're used as what's called standard candles. And they are the uh, way in which it was determined that there has to be something that's making the universe not just contract, I mean, expand and contract or slow down its expansion, but actually accelerate its expansion. And that's the dark energy that was in that first uh, slide. Okay, type two supernova is the one that uh, occurs when you have uh, a core collapse. Uh, the, everything becomes iron. There's no longer any uh, reactions to stabilize the star because the star was being stabilized at these different stages because of the energy generated by the nuclear reactions. No more energy. Star gravitationally collapses. It gets blown apart and you get the R and P processes occurring uh, and the remnant can either be a neutron star or a black hole. This is the result of a very detailed comp comp uh, computation of a supernova explosion. For years, because we didn't have the computing power, we believed that they were spherically symmetric, uh, which was pretty uh, naive, but we didn't have the computing power. Now we can make a, a real three-dimensional model. And this is a simulation of what a uh, 15 solar mass star turns into when it supernovas early on. And then one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is the Crab Nebula. In the year 1054, there was a supernova explosion that was very carefully uh, charted in its brightness, uh, measured over a period of time by Chinese, Japanese, and Korean astronomers. Uh, a few astronomers in the Middle East. And there's a petroglyph in Arizona that is believed to be a picture of this where, because it first appeared when the uh, crescent moon was nearby. Uh, somehow there's maybe one or two possible comments about it in uh, European journals, but it clearly wasn't seriously studied. This is what it looks like about a thousand years later. Uh, so any spherically symmetric picture. I love this picture. Uh, for anybody who, uh, well, you don't know I'm the, about Facebook, but this is my Facebook image. Uh, <laughs> I love that picture. Partly because it really puts together the story in a very nice way, for, particularly for the supernovae. OK, the first stage of stellar evolution uh, I can't tell what the time is. Uh, it's getting close, I think. So I may skip over some of this pretty quickly. But anyway, the first stage is the fusion of hydrogen into helium. Uh, it occurs in the core of the central part of the star, E equals mc squared. Einstein always has something to say about these things. And it converts 7 tenths of 1% of the hydrogen mass into, into helium. Uh, it does it by two different methods, the proton-proton chain and the CNO cycle. It depends on how big the star is. For massive stars, it turns out the CNO cycle dominates for the sun. It's only the proton-proton chain. Uh, 
the uh, basic details of the proton-proton chain is six hydrogens come together to make helium-4, but you get two hydrogens back in that particular process. They're really nice details, but I'm, I wasn't planning to, to go into the actual step-by-step -step details. The carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle, four hydrogens are added to a carbon sequentially, not all at one time, and what happens is at the very last step, you get helium and you get your carbon back. So in that sense, carbon is almost like a catalyst. And for high temperature CNO, uh, and this is a nice picture, temperature on the, on the horizontal axis, the, the reaction rate, don't worry about what the units are. But you can see that for the sun, this is the 14 million kelvins the sun is, both are occurring, but the proton-proton chain is much more uh, dominant because it increases like temperature to the fourth power. The CNO cycle increases by temperature to the 17th power. Uh, you really get to use your algebra with that. Uh, and ultimately, once you get up here, the CNO cycle is going to really dominate this whole picture. Okay, when the core is, uh, when the hydrogen is, is depleted in the core, you get three helium fours come together to make carbon 12. It's called the triple alpha reaction. Once carbon 12 is formed, it uh, can react with some of the helium to make oxygen 16. Bringing three things together at the same time is really kind of complicated. And uh, Fred Hoyle is responsible for saying it had to happen. We've got carbon in our universe. There has to be a way to do that. He told the nuclear physicists, go back to the laboratory and measure it right this time. And indeed, he was correct. Okay. For low mass stars, the helium cycle is, is the last one. Uh, and so our sun is going to someday, five and a half billion years from now, the white dwarf is going to be there. And this is a spherical shell, but the way you're looking at it from the side, uh, you, you see through the uh, direct observing we're out we're of course we're perpendicular to that slide to the screen but what we see is the beautiful uh, this is all the hydrogen and helium that's been blown off of the surface not exactly uh, uh, quietly but certainly way way less violent than a supernova explosion okay they go through more and more processes we talked a little bit about it. we get to the silicon melting uh, and then the core collapse uh, supernova occurs. There's a couple of things I want to talk about, and I think it is getting close to six, so I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Uh, one of the most important, if not the most important process for going beyond the Iron Peak is the R process. Uh, it occurs in, in supernova, and now we know it occurs in uh, merging binary stars. Also, there's one other uh, source we'll talk about that in a second. Most of the isotopes come from the R process. But we still need the S process, and I have a nice diagram that I'll show you in a minute why that's true, and we have to have the P process. Um, the S process occur occurs in the outer region of giant stars because it's the addition of neutrons. Neutrons are not charged, and therefore they can react at low temperatures, so which, is a, which is a very nice thing. And this is the other case of actually having seeing things as they happen. Because these stars, they have seen the spectrum of technetium and promethium in these stars. Technetium and promethium are the two uh, lighter elements in the periodic uh, table that have no stable isotopes. And their lo longest half-lives are something like 10,000 years. So if you see them in the envelope of these stars, the only answer could be they're being made there. Because if they were there when the star was formed, they'd all have di decayed away. So this is one of the greatest confirmations for the fact that the S process is occurring. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, the P process, uh, I mentioned that before, has to be made. We, we're not exactly sure how it is made. We measured up in the cyclotron and boulder some of the P process reactions. but. Uh, these are so rare that we don't see them. Sorry, what is the P process? The P process can be a number of things. It could be the addition of a proton. 
It can be a proton striking a nucleus and knocking a neutron out. It can be a neutrino striking the nucleus and forcing a uh, neutron to, to leave. Whatever either adds protons or, or uh, does away with neutrons uh, is, can be considered part of the P process. It is really fuzzy. It's one of the areas that we don't understand as well as some of the others. Um, okay, again, you've seen this three times now. Uh, again, I want to point out these are the beta minus decays. And now, my absolute favorite slide of this whole show. Why do the heavy nuclei, this is, imagine, this is a blown up section of some part of this where we're making R, S, and P nuclei. Okay, now, when something beta decays, these neutrons are being added like Avogadro's number 10 to the 23rd in a second. Now, they won't all stick. There's a thing called the neutron drip line, but basically they're as neutron rich as they can possibly be. They don't want to be neutron rich. They want to beta decay. And when they beta decay, they come down a line like this. Why do they come down a line like that? The beta decay does not change the atomic mass. It increases the proton number and decreases the neutron number. Therefore, it's a 45 degree line. Okay, so this is say a snapshot of uh, blown up of that one of a small region of that uh, chart that, that has uh, uh, all of the nuclides on it. So first of all, we talk about the P process. Not, we don't know exactly what's happening. We have a bunch of candidates, but we're not sure how much of each of them really does occur. Uh, these can't be reached by neutrons. They are totally shielded by these stable nuclei. So we're not going to get any decay that causes these. They can only be made by some process that doesn't involve adding neutrons. These can only be made by the beta decay because there's no, so let's follow this uh, to make this a little bit clearer. Let's just start with this one. This somehow could have been made by S and R that doesn't show it on this chart. It goes over here by adding a neutron it has plenty of time to decay because it's adding it very slowly. S for slow, it beta decays to here. But we can also get an R process uh, beta decay to make that. Here, it can only be made by the S process because this nucleus shields it from R process beta decay. It adds a neutron here, it adds another neutron, and it beta decays to here. But again, we can also get uh, uh, an R process neutron and so on. This one, on the other hand, it's sheltered by this uh, R process, so it can only be made by the S process. So basically what we have to do in order to, to uh, sh reach the, the agreement with those abundance charts is by uh, <coughs> sort of divvying this up, to some of them by S, some of them by R. It works really quite well. Okay, possible astrophysical sites for the R process, core collapse, supernovae, neutron star mergers, and now recently people have been able to calculate a very rapidly spinning, highly magnetic uh, star when it goes supernova, becomes a hypernova, and a lot of the material gets thrown out and doesn't go into the black hole, and that's where people are pretty sure we get a lot of nucleosynthesis. But the neutron star merger has actually been uh, seen. Okay, on August 17th, uh, 2017, a gravitational wave event was detected. It was a neutron star merger. Because it, it was able to be located fairly well, we were able to find the galaxy where it occurred, and everybody and their brother who knew about this, radio astronomy, gamma ray astronomy, uh, x-ray astronomy, ultraviolet, visible light, Everyone looked at this, and this is where we actually saw that, that nucleosynthesis was occurring. Like I say, this is one of the most exciting things, and if not the most exciting thing in my entire uh, history of studying this. And here's a nice picture of an uh, artist's model of what a Murray neutron star might look like. Okay, let's get back to the question of lithium, beryllium, and boron. Uh, the question that the way I poke, sorry about that. The way I posed the question was, 
uh, why is there so little? The real question is, why is there any? Because we jumped over them when we put three heliums together to make carbon-12. The same thing that kept uh, George Gamow's picture from, from working. So basically, we have to make them outside of a star. If we tried to make them by any nuclear reaction in a star, they are so fragile they would break up. So they have to be made in places like the, uh, uh, in the atmosphere of a star or in interstellar space. So very high energy uh, hydrogen and helium particles, cosmic rays, smash into the carbon-12, which we know is fairly abundant. They break up, and this has been measured and, uh, in, uh, in uh, particle accelerators, and we get all of these. The one exception, we get that, but we also have some that was left over from the Big Bang. So we have to look at lithium-7 a little bit differently. Okay, the chemical elements in our solar system. We did a pretty good job of fitting that. Thank you. Okay. Questions? I guess we need lights. <laughs> Randy. I'm not exactly cogent to this, but uh, you mentioned that is temperature more important than pressure at the center of the star? All of them are. All of them are? Right. Uh, it's interesting, though, but the, um, uh, when they actually do the calculations, the, the, this is the thing that the theoretical astrophysicists do, the, there is a parameter which we as experimental nuclear physicists provide them, and it only depends on temperature. So the, the density, which is really the, the important thing, the density goes into the reaction rates. And so it's sort of external to the actual nuclear properties. But it is an important parameter, because if the density was very low, you'd have a low reaction rate. If the density is high because the pressure is high, then you have a high reaction rate. But we as nuclear physicists give them this thing. This is what the reaction rate between X and Y are as a function of temperature. Have fun with it. So you're saying the proximity is important? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, you know, the, the, this, the fact, well, I'll just say this because um, this is way too long for a talk. I'm, I also apologize for running over as it was. Classically, nuclear reactions cannot occur. It is impossible for nuclear reactions to occur, and it wasn't until quantum mechanics was invented that we actually figured out how nuclear reactions can occur because of quantum mechanics. George Gamow figured it out. There's a very important parameter that we use, which is called the Gamow penetration factor. And a personal story, when I was coming here for my job interview in 1967, George Gamow was still alive and, and at the Boulder campus. I had to give a seminar to the physics department in Boulder, and George Gamow was going to be in the audience. So I, I stated to my host a little bit of anxiety about this, and he said, don't worry, he'll fall asleep. And he did. <laughs> So talking about gamma penetration factors in front of George Gamow was kind of fun. Yes? Uh, are there some of these processes that can only happen uh, in a second generation star where there were some non-hydrogen elements? To oh, yeah. No, we, uh, there are a lot of things I had to leave out, and I still ran over. But there's a thing now that we believe. Clyde, uh, could you repeat the question? Oh, uh, or can we pass the? Just basically, were there processes? Uh, that uh, occur in some stars that can't occur in other stars, basically. And the idea is that we have to get to the iron peak. If we don't get to the iron peak, we can't make elements heavier than the iron peak because the iron peak is the seed for that. So we now think that they're really very old stars. They've all, they were big, massive, they didn't live very long, and they blew up, and they provided the next generation of stars, which are called population two stars, with enough iron so that when those stars went through their life cycle, the seed was there to make the, the R, S, and P process. And, and I was wondering about the CNO cycle. Um, to, to use that cycle, does a star have to get its carbon from an earlier star? Yes. So we don't think that the earliest stars, despite the fact that they were big and massive, there wasn't enough carbon around for them to use the CNO cycle. Uh, so. Yes. Was that 
two neutron star collect collisions? Is that a new idea? I mean, I, we always heard before of supernovas doing things, but I didn't know there were some of those. Oh, the uh, idea that they produced the R process is about 10 years old. So it's kind of interesting. The idea was there when we actually saw it, which is really great. Um, so that that you know this was something, the 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 uh, high high spinning the the hypernovae stars that's also a fairly new idea. We have not, to my knowledge, seen that, but the calculations say you should get sort of the same kind of magnitude. For a long time, uh, the only possible uh, mechanism they knew were type two supernova, but they were always a little nervous because. Although they were sure they made the R process elements, they didn't make enough of them. And each neutron star, binary neutron star merger, makes 10,000 times as much R process elements as a, as a type II supernova. So now we say, whew, okay, we have enough, and now we got something else to make them. So I don't think there's any question that we've got enough R process. We're just not sure how to divvy it up in terms of which one of those three astrophysical, and we can, may come up with another one, who knows. This is always in, in flux. The 1957, the, the, the B squared FH and Cameron papers, there's an awful lot of the physics that we didn't know at that time. But they did a really good job of building the scaffolding for this whole theory. Other questions? <coughs> Randy. So our, uh, my understanding, is that when you hit iron at the star, that kind of chokes it, blows it up? No, basically what happens is, it, okay, there's a very nice model, which is the star, a, a massive star is like an onion. So you've got the, the iron core, you have silicon melting, you have carbon uh, and oxygen burning, you've got helium burning, you've got hy hydrogen burning in shells. So they actually call it the onion model, uh, having nothing to do with uh, Shrek number one. If any of you uh, have watched that. Anyway, so basically once you have reached the point where you only have iron at the core, it can't support itself. It gravitationally uh, contracts in an incredibly rapid time and it releases neutrinos. 98% of the energy in a supernova, despite the fact however bright it is and all of the different wavelengths, way before we see it, 98% of all the energy has been uh, sent out in terms of neutrinos, which are very unreactive. And so our sun will never have uh, iron in it? Only what it was born with. And it was born with some. Because it's a fairly new star, about 2% of our sun is elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. Stars that are being born today have more like 4%. Other questions? Yes. So, I mean, I don't really know much about stars, but what makes some stars so massive? What, what is that initial push that makes all that gas just come together over a large period of time? You know I, mean? I, I don't, yes, I do know what you mean. There is what's called a uh, stellar birth function. Now, we can't, I can't answer your question for what, you, what you're trying to understand. It depends on the environment in which they start to collapse. So if there's more mass around, the star is going to be more massive. More than half of the stars in the sky are in not as solar uh, uh, stars all by themselves. They're in binary and multiple star systems. So the way in which the stars are born, uh, I mean, I'm sure there are astronomers that, that study that, but uh, there's no simple answer. It, it depends on the environment when the conditions are right for them to collapse. Because come together as gravity. I don't know if that was your question. Well, yeah, of course, gravity. <laughs> right. Gives them that push. And and one of the things I I, I poo pooed the whole thing with the dark matter, uh, but it turns out that the whole idea of galaxies forming, uh, we had a problem with it until we realized that dark matter plays an extremely important role in forming uh, the stars and in, in galaxies, uh, even though they don't directly participate, they provide the gravitational force. Dark matter, 
very quickly, uh, we had uh, Dr. Milano talk on this uh, a few months ago, uh, but very quickly, dark matter is something we have no clue what it is except it's there and we feel its gravitational effects. And that's the only way we know it's there because there are a number of different uh, venues in which their gravity is very important. But what are they? Who knows? So say that again, that the dark matter is affecting uh, the stellar Right. The, the, uh, with a few exceptions, uh, every, the people who study dark matter, that for a galaxy to have formed, there had to be an excess of dark matter in that region. Uh, this is way out of my, I'm a nuclear physicist, but this is what I'm told. Wouldn't this, this question of why they form, I mean, this, this discovery that the, that the background, the radiation is not uniform, that the universe isn't uniform. Right. Therefore, by chance, you're going to have some areas oh, that yes. are denser, and therefore right. you get bigger stars and smaller. So that would be a... Oh, yes. Kind of right. But, but that's on a scale of, of galax galaxies as opposed to individual regions. The, one of the things that the Hubble telescope has been looking at is, is uh, nurseries, as they call it, you know, where there's a large number of stars being formed. There's still... Stars are still being formed today, brand new stars, before they actually become a star, which is defined when they start burning nuclear fuel. Prior to that, they're getting hot. They're almost there. They're called protostars. And then when they become actual stars, they're burning nuclear fuel. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Clyde. You're welcome.